Welcome to the Center for Business and Economic Insights Spring uh, 2021 report. We normally hold these presentations at breakfast, uh, and we have uh, we have our presenters present uh, in, in front of a group of, of people from the community, and we are looking to return to that. And so we are looking to have an in-person breakfast uh, in December. Uh, more details will come later. Um, the good news is it looks like COVID is certainly on the run. The CDC gave us all very good news uh, yesterday. So we were able to kind of return to our tradition of having those breakfasts. Uh, today's feature, basic, today's uh, uh, um, event uh, features two presenters, Professor Kevin Barr. Um, he's the chief analyst here at the CBEI. And he, his report would be the economy, where we've been and where we're going, uh, which will give us some good context in terms of where we are coming out of the pandemic in terms of uh, uh, potential for recovery. And it's also looking at some long-term cha challenges with regard to debts and deficits. Uh, after Kevin, we have uh, Professor Dave Shallow will be presenting our special topic report housing bubble, the dynamics of the real estate market in central Wisconsin. He will be analyzing the current real estate cycle uh, in central Wisconsin and in the nation overall, uh, and how that's impacting uh, availability of housing and housing prices. After both uh, presentations, we will have time to answer your questions. So if you have a question, please use the chat box in, in Zoom to send your questions, and then we will have that and ask uh, our presenters those questions after the presentations have been finished. We will also be taking attendance for those students who are attending for a pro events credit. That will occur at the end of the event, and I will be giving some instructions uh, uh, of, uh, of for, for those students in terms of the attendance at that time. In addition, each of you will receive a digital copy of our publication, uh, a flipping book version, uh, as well as a Zoom recording of our presentation today. Uh, um, in addition uh, to um, having a, um, a publication with regard to Professor Barr and, and Professor Shallow's reports, uh, it, uh, we will also have some other features. We will have our uh, economic indicators report which uh, provides a deep dive in, in terms of economic data at the national and local level. Uh, also, uh, this issue's Insight Spotlight uh, is the creative economy, life after the pandemic, uh, which is authored by uh, Greg Wright, who's an executive director of Create Portage County, uh, and Jason Davis, who's a professor of economics here at UWSP. And they will be talking about the importance of the creative economy for local economic development and the impact uh, the pandemic actually has, has had, had on innovation within that creative economy, a very interesting article. Uh, before we uh, get started, I just want to have a, a number of thank yous. Uh, there's a number of people that are critical in terms of their contributions for what we do here. Uh, first and foremost is Eva Donahue. She's Tremendous. Uh, um, she's our publication and website designer. Uh, and uh, so when you see uh, the publication, she's responsible for, for formatting. Also, in terms of the covers as well, she, she plays uh, you know, the, the, the sort of artistic role in, in, in creating those, those covers, as well as our website as well. Uh, so she, she, we really appreciate her efforts. Kevin Barra, obviously, she, he's the chief analyst. Uh, here at the CBI. Also, he, he has a blog, uh, so go to our website. And we also uh, send out um, um, uh, um, a blog that, that he, he releases on a uh, periodic basis. Uh, in addition, I also want to uh, thank uh, Natalie Neskovich. Uh, she's a recent, uh, or actually a current, uh, um, she will be a spring graduate of our UWSP uh, MBA program. She provided uh, Professor Shallow some really uh, important data that allowed him to do analysis of the local area. Uh, she's also a co-owner of Lakeland Realty. So thank you so much, uh, Natalie. And also lastly, I'd like to thank our, the head of the School of Business and Economics for his support. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kevin New. So with that in mind, I want to introduce our first presenter and that's uh, Kevin Barr. Uh, he's the chief analyst, as I mentioned, um, um, for the um, 
for the CBEI. In addition, he's been with the School of Business and Economics since 1999. He has a PhD uh, in finance from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. In addition to that, he's got a master's in economics and, and master's in accounting, also from UW-Milwaukee. He has 10 years of experience uh, at Robert Baird and Company. He, at, there, he was the vice president of corporate finance and also a securities analyst at that time. And he currently teaches uh, finance classes at both the undergrad and MBA level. So uh, with that in mind, uh, Kevin, why don't you uh, give your presentation? All right, thank you very much, Scott. Um, all right, how are we doing? Can everybody see this? Scott, Scott, can you see the screen? Uh, um, yes, they, they said we can see you. Okay. So, uh, but let's see if, if can you can people see the uh, the the um, can you see the screen? Can, can they can you see the screen? No, they can't see the screen. I'm not sure why. Okay. I'm not sure exactly why either here. How are we doing now? Good to go? All right, excellent. All right, thanks everybody. <clears throat> oh, we're gonna miss these Zoom meetings. There's no question about that. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us today and for the last couple of times and we've had to go through this uh, Zoom meeting stuff. We greatly appreciate your uh, you're joining in and kind of your patience here as we kind of get everything uh, rolling here the way we're supposed to be uh, going here. All right, so without further ado, let's spend about 15 to 20 minutes just kind of talking about where we've been and where we're, uh, where we are hopefully going. Um, in terms of where we have been, 2020 was a, a pretty dismal year for economic growth or lack thereof here in the United States. That uh, was the fifth worst year in history. Three of the uh, uh, five worst years were from the uh, Great Depression era. 1946 came in number two, but that was pretty much expected with the uh, ramp down after World War II, so you definitely expect an economic contraction. So 2020 comes in as the first, uh, as the fifth worst year for economic growth. And again, economic growth is measured by your change in the gross domestic product, and that's basically measuring the change in the value of goods and services produced over the entire year. And you can see there, 2020 comes in number five, the financial crisis in 2009, that came in in 2006. Before we really uh, kind of bottomed out in 2020, things were already starting to go down before 2020. This takes a look at the year-to-year uh, -year changes in GDP quarter by quarter. If you look at 2019, Every year, economic growth was lower than the previous year. Uh, 2020, you got a little bump up with the tax cuts, or excuse me, 2018, you got a little bump up with the tax cuts. Uh, but that was really kind of a very short-term thing. By 2019, things were slowing down. By 2020, second quarter of 2020, COVID hits. And the second quarter of 2020, that was the worst quarter uh, since the uh, U.S. government was tracking data on quarterly GDP growth, uh, that's the worst quarter we've ever had since 1947. So things are pretty bad. 
Um, this kind of, I think that top line in particular really kind of puts it in perspective on how bad things got last year. During the financial crisis, uh, basically end of 2007, early 2009, 8.7 million jobs lost over two years. COVID-19, you lost 22.3 million jobs, so almost three times as many jobs in over two months. So it's kind of like you're looking at almost three times as many jobs lost in about one twelfth the amount of time. So it was, uh, it was a pretty tough year last year for the United States. Uh, as of March 2021, employment has improved, still 8 million fewer jobs in March 2021 compared to uh, 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 basically uh, kind of pre-COVID times. But I'll kind of update that a little bit once we get to the end of the present, or once I get to the end of my presentation, I'll kind of clue you in in terms of what went on in April. This kind of gives you a little graph of things in terms of where we've gone with uh, employment. You can kind of see we've been coming back since uh, since April of 2020, but still a pretty significant fall off uh, compared to where we were kind of pre-COVID. In addition to the unemployment numbers, another thing that skyrocketed last year was poverty. Um, and it's, it was pretty significant for, in particular, some groups. Uh, the number of non-elderly individuals living in families with uh, earnings below the poverty line, that increased by 28% uh, in 2020. So obviously that's a pretty significant increase. There were some groups that really took a hit. If you look at non-elderly Black individuals below the poverty line, that increased 40%. Latino individuals below the poverty line, that increased 34%. If you look at the number of children uh, in families below poverty, uh, below the poverty level earnings, that went up 34%. So obviously a tough year last year. If you're looking at unemployment, if you're looking at poverty levels, 2020 was an awful tough year. However, if you look at the financial markets, once you got by the first quarter of 2020, it was kind of up, up and away. Uh, the S&P 500, very diversified stock index, basically measuring the performance of large companies, um, that was up over 16%. The average annual return for large company stocks in the U.S. between about 11 and 12%. Uh, small company stocks on average coming around 16%, all the Russell 2000, which is a small cap index, that was up 18%. And the NASDAQ, that's technology index, that was incredible last year, that was up 43%. So if you put all your money in the NASDAQ index last year, good for you, it can maybe help you afford to buy a house based on how uh, housing prices have been going. And Dave's gonna talk about that once um, I get done with kind of the first presentation we got today. This kind of shows you on a quarterly, quarterly basis how things went last year. The first quarter last year was tough. All three of those major stock uh, indexes were down in the first quarter of last year, but the second quarter, everything was pretty much fully rebounded and, and technology stocks, the gains in the second quarter were basically twice the amount of what the losses were in the first quarter. So the stock market, which is a precursor to what is expected to happen in the future doesn't really reflect too much what's going on now. It's what is expected to happen in the future. The stock market is definitely looking for the uh, post-COVID recovery, and it started doing that in the second quarter of 2020. So unemployment was high, poverty was growing, but the financial markets were saying, okay, after this COVID-19, uh, it's going to be uh, kind of a, a good economic recovery for the United States. In early 2021, uh, the economic news started to join kind of the good news in the financial markets. Uh, after a string of eight consecutive quarters in which GDP growth was lower relative to the previous year's quarter, GDP growth finally increased. Not by a lot, but it didn't really have to be by a lot. The point was the magnitude was really important. So you had an increase in GDP relative to the prior year quarter. Retail, uh, retail and food sales, they were up significantly in the first quarter. First time unemployment insurance weekly claims continued to go down and basically in April were at their lowest level since March, 2020. So the economic news was positive. It was kind of reflecting uh, or the, the 
the financial markets, what the financial markets were expecting in 2020 started to get reflected in the economic news in the first quarter of 2021. Um, in addition to where we're going, once, uh, I mean, the economic recovery started to kick in in the first quarter of 2021, and typically what happens when you start getting economic growth, it pretty much typically continues. It's kind of like a snowball rolling downhill. Once you got the momentum, you put more people in work, more people go back to work, they've got more money to spend, they spend more money. That means more people will be employed because demand for products goes up. Uh, pretty much continues unless there's kind of a bump in the road. Uh, President, has, uh, President Biden has proposed an infrastructure plan, which would certainly um, influence how the economic recovery continues going forward if it gets passed. It is a $2 trillion infrastructure plan with about an eight year time frame. Three major areas to the infrastructure. There's more details with this in our blog if you want to check out the uh, kind of the details of the infrastructure plan, but it's three primary areas transportation infrastructure, 611 billion, the power grid internet, water systems, getting let out of pipes, making sure you have uh, high-speed internet access to rural communities, that's 337 billion. And then one point, about 1.2 trillion for housing, schools, and schools pretty much uh, elementary, secondary, and the tech colleges, not really the university systems, but housing, schools, workforce development, $1.2 trillion. So fund that infrastructure plan, Part of that proposal is that uh, corporate taxes would be increased. Um, I'll get to the individual coming up here, the individual taxes coming up here, but in terms of funding the infrastructure plan, the proposal is pretty much to do it through an increase in the corporate tax rate. And that would include increasing the statutory, that is the legal corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. Uh, it had been 35% until 2018 when the Tax Act lowered it from 35 to 21%. Also establishing a minimum tax of 15% in the book income of large corporations. I'll kind of get into that a little bit with the next slide. Uh, also to eliminate offshoring tax incentives. Um, the whole point is basically with this tax bill, it's is to kind of make sure that corporations pay a minimum tax. And I'll kind of get into that with the next slide to show you why that was proposed and to increase the statutory rate from 21 to 28%. And again, it had been 35% uh, under President Obama, it had been 35% under President Bush, under President Clinton uh, back in the, um, Reagan days, I believe the top rate was about 34%. So 21%, again, that was lowered in uh, 2018. Separate from the infrastructure plan, just to kind of fill in a little bit in, on the individual taxes, uh, the, um, it is also proposed that the top tax rate, and again, we have a progressive tax structure in the United States, you go through progressively higher and higher tax brackets and the top tax rate applies to the top tax bracket, which is another way of saying if you have taxable income of $50,000, you would pay the same amount of taxes on your $50,000 taxable income as Bill Gates would pay on his first $50,000 of taxable income. You're both paying the same rates. But obviously, Bill is making more money, so eventually he would be pushed into the 39.6% bracket. Um, that 39.6%, uh, tax rate uh, that was in place under President Obama. Uh, that was in place in the 1990s under President Clinton before it was lowered in the Bush years. But that just kind of gives you some idea why the 37% is proposed to go back to 39.6%. So we had under Clinton, so we had under Obama. No income tax increase for taxpayers less than uh, $400,000 in income. Um, if you have greater than $1 million in income, the capital gains tax rate would be increased from the, uh, would be increased to your ordinary tax rate from the current capital gains rate. All right, so it's a little bit of diversions to kind of clue you in what's been going on with the individual or what's proposed to go on with the individual taxes. This gets back to the corporate tax stuff a little bit. All right, in terms of the corporate tax rate, it gets to be a little bit complex, not really all that simple. So the statutory tax rate is proposed to go from 21 to 28%. 
Well, a lot of companies don't pay that statutory tax rate. There's a difference between book taxable income and then what you actually get to pay for um, tax purposes. So for many corporations, their effective tax rate, that is the rate that you're actually paying on your uh, income, it's lower than 28%, it's lower than 21%. Uh, a study done by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Um, it's 57 companies had an effective tax rate greater than 21%, 322 companies had an effective tax rate of less than 21%. So part of President Biden's proposal is for large corporations is to have a minimum tax rate. Uh, for example, last two years, the effective tax rate for GM was about 1%. So even though you have a statutory tax rate going from 21 to 28%, I mean, even the statutory of 21% doesn't mean that that's the tax rate that's actually paid by corporations. That can be reduced uh, from uh, certain deductions and certain credits. Um, so kind of gives you some of the rationale in terms of why the proposal in terms of not only increasing the statutory rate from 21 to 28 percent, but to also have a minimum tax rate on book income of 15 percent. All right. Why finance the infrastructure with tax increases? Let's talk about this fairly quickly. Well, the budget deficit, and that's when the United States spends more than what it takes in through tax revenue. Uh, that's kind of been going through the roof, basically twice the level currently of what we had relative to 2009. And when you look at budget deficits, you have to spend money when you have economic recessions like we had in 2020. Uh, 2020 was not the time to have any type of austerity programs. So it wasn't going to happen. The deficit started to increase with the tax cuts of 2018. And typically, you don't want that deficit to go up when you're in a period of economic growth, because if it does and something goes wrong like it did, it's going to have a significant negative impact on the deficit like it did in 2020. The amount of U.S. debt outstanding, that's pretty much been going through the roof over twice the level relative to what uh, we had back in the financial crisis. So one measure that's used to sort of gauge do you have too much debt or not is the debt to GDP. And the reason why that ratio was sometimes used. All right. So if you owe a million dollars of debt, is it a lot? Well, not if you're making 20 million, but it is if you're making 50,000. So it's kind of like you want to look at the debt to income. GDP not only measures output in the United States, it also measures income in the United States. So the debt to GDP uh, ratio was at a record 105, uh, 135% in 2020. Uh, that's more than double from where we were at, or well, I shouldn't say double, but about up about 150% more than that. Uh, relative to the end of the financial crisis. Now, the difficult question is, when does that become too high? And that's kind of, well, it's kind of difficult to say exactly when it becomes too high. Um, increasing the debt, it does kind of lower your financial flexibility because, okay, if you have a lot of debt outstanding, if interest rates start to go up, yeah, then you're going to have to pay more in interest expense, and that is going to increase what the, what the country has to pay. Um, but it just is not easy to say when is that ratio too high. And there's a couple different factors that play into that. Federal Reserve, inflation, interest rates. When the government borrows money, that's pretty much done through the Treasury Department. So if the U.S. government spends more in a given year than what it takes in through tax revenues, you got a deficit. You've got to fund that. Treasury Department issues debt. It's sold to different investors. You could buy treasury debt if you want to. That helps finance the government deficit. The Federal Reserve, they're basically controlling the amount of money circulating in the United States economy. They can actually, in essence, print money and, and buy the debt. So it's like you can offer debt on the one hand and buy it back on the other hand. And the Federal Reserve has been buying a lot. Well, the trick is you can buy back debt, but yeah, you got to watch how much you buy because that could potentially lead to inflation if you get too much money circulating in the United States uh, economy. Record amount of federal debt held by the Federal Reserve at $5 trillion at the end of 2020. That's seven times the amount of federal debt that they held at the end of the financial crisis. So they've been buying debt. They've been buying a lot of it. 
because they were buying some of that debt last year. The debt to GDP ratio actually declined from 135% to 129%. So yeah, the ratio is high, but okay, in the one hand, you can buy, the Federal Reserve can buy some of it back. Uh, what about inflation? There's no doubt you're going to have some short-term inflation, at least in some markets. Travel, leisure, you can expect some prices to go up because you've got pent-up demand there. Dave's going to talk about the housing market in a few minutes. Lumber prices have kind of gone through the rough. If you look at the bond market, typically financial markets should reflect any expected increases in inflation. There's been some increase in interest rates at the long-term end, but not, if you can look at those rates on the chart, it's not real significant. So overall, the financial markets are kind of saying, yeah, you, you'll have some inflation in the long run, but there's nothing that would be indicated in the bond market. Because again, if there's more inflation expected, investors typically want to make sure they can cover that rate of inflation. So you would expect interest rates on bonds to increase. And that's happened a little bit, but it has not happened significantly as of yet. All right, one kind of final comment here in terms of the labor market. Now, just to clue you in in terms of what happened in April, because that report kind of came out fairly recently. You'll have some turmoil, I think, in the labor market over the next couple of months. The April job increases were uh, fairly low, much less than what was expected. But uh, we're kind of going through a little bit of a different time right now. I think the labor market's strong and things will work themselves out in the next couple of months. Uh, in April, it's like one job number. Uh, you got some different things going on in terms of why weren't there more job increases. Uh, some uh, businesses can't find the workers that they need. So, okay, what's kind of going on? I think you got kind of some different issues going on. Um, some people have gotten vaccinated. Some people haven't gotten vaccinated for the most part, I think by June 1st. Uh, just about every adult in the United States will have been able to get a vaccine. That's pretty remarkable. So one thing when you're kind of planning for the uh, how long to um, continue the unemployment benefits, I think that was a difficult call for a Congress and the president to kick off this year. Yes, in some cases, unemployment benefits may exceed wages. I think in other cases, you might have workers might be a little tentative to go back to work, uh, potentially be exposed to non-vaccinated customers, co-workers. There could be a, a mismatch between skills and the type of the worker desired by employers. I think the job market's gonna change a little bit. You're not gonna go back to the way things used to be pre-COVID. Businesses may not wanna pay workers a certain desired salary. In addition to that, childcare issues if the business reopens before schools reopen, um, it could be difficult for people to go back to work. So all this stuff, I think will work itself out in the next couple of months, particularly with the, um, uh, revamp CDC guidelines uh, regarding masks that they came out with yesterday. So I think by the end of the summer, the labor market will stabilize. So if you wrap all this stuff up, we got economic growth that return in the first quarter should continue to go until the next bump or shock. Like I said, it's like a snowball going downhill until the next bump or shock, financial crisis, pandemic, growth is gonna occur. How it occurs, that would be shaped by the infrastructure plan if that is passed. Um, and if the infrastructure plan is passed, the idea is you fund that with a corporate tax increase, which is sort of reallocating the money that businesses would have spent. The federal government will then spend it on different programs, uh, as opposed to simply borrowing the money, which would further increase any concerns over inflation. For right now, interest rates are low. The housing market's been hot. They will take care of that in a couple of seconds. And inflation in some sectors, yes, you'll, you've seen some increases. Um, but again, long-term inflation right now, based on the financial markets, uh, not a lot is expected. Thank you very much. Okay, Kevin, thank you. And uh, if, you, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would that would be very good. And um, again, a reminder uh, to those who are uh, attending, uh, if you have any questions for Kevin or our next speaker, please uh, uh, write those in the, in the chat box and I'll keep an eye on those, uh, on those questions. So our next speaker is, is Dr. Dave Shallow. He will be presenting his uh, report, The Housing Bubble, The Dynamics of the Real Estate Market in Central Wisconsin. 
uh, uh, Dr. Dave Shallow has been with UWSP since uh, 2008. He teaches marketing, sales, real estate, entrepreneurship, investments, and financial planning. So he's a bit of a Renaissance man. Um, he's also before he became before he came back to Wisconsin, uh, where where he's originally from. He was at the he was in the University of California system. Um, I think it was UC San Bernardino, and you can correct me, Dave, uh, with that. Um, and there he, he, in addition to his work at the university, uh, he also owned his own real estate and mortgage company. So he's, he's really sees uh, all aspects uh, of the real estate market. He's an author of a real estate textbook, uh, California Real Estate Principles, and his other business experience in, includes working in insurance uh, and, and, and securities as well. Uh, in addition to his PhD, uh, he has a, a large number of pro uh, professional designations, inc including uh, he's a chartered financial planner, a chartered life underwriter, and graduate real estate institute. And there's others as well, but you know I can go on for a half hour. So we're going to stop there. And uh, and Dave, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the nice intro. Let me get right to it. I'm going to share my screen here in a second. I hope. There we go. Um, and I hope you can see it. There. Okay. Okay, we are ready to go. Uh, as you can see from the title, uh, asks if we are in a housing bubble. The reason for the title is probably the most common question I get from people when they find out what I do and what industry I'm in. And uh, they're worried about their house prices. And now initially they're really happy about it, but they're worried it's gonna end. So the question I want you to think about as I do the presentation is it's, good, it's basically a bubble if you can't explain why prices are going up. As Kevin mentioned, prices are clearly up. Everybody's sort of aware of that. And what we're gonna try and do today is see if there is a way to uh, identify exactly why. Because if it is explainable, uh, rational, then it's not a bubble. Then it's just good news for house prices. So that's kind of where the, uh, I want you to be thinking about as we go through our material. Now here you see the supply, the, if you've ever had an economics class, uh, you've seen the famous supply and demand curve. And the uh, downward sloping part is demand, the upward part is supply. And this is kind of the way you uh, try to understand what is behind a market. And in this case, the real estate market it would apply to the gas prices and labor rates and everything. Now, a lot of people find this to be confusing. I know I did, like if we draw another, as soon as we draw another line on here and we go from the old level of demand to the new level of demand, suddenly this gets complex. I always had trouble with this as a student. I don't know if you did when you were in school, but I finally understood it when a kindly econ professor I had in my PhD program as I was having trouble doing exam questions, he might have a graph like this and say, well, uh, for 10 points, you know, the uh, problems were 10 points, he'd say, well, explain this. And oh, gee, I had no idea, I get confused. So he explained to me, and I, that's why I'll share it with you. The important thing to remember, he, he always told me was wherever two lines cross, wherever the lines cross, that's really important. And if you're ever taking a test on this for all the students out there, all you got to really do is circle where the lines crossed. Then you've, you've hit the main uh, key points. And then you write the word equilibrium. If you do that on your essay question, well, equilibrium is why the two lines gravitate to where they cross there. And then one final thing you have to always remember, he told me. On your exam, you write, ran out of time. Well, if you do that, 
my professor told me, you certainly won't get 10 points because you didn't really nail it, but you might get as many as seven because you hit the key points are where those lines cross. And the reason is markets form and go to equilibrium. Now, some of you are probably laughing at me, but don't laugh. I have a PhD, this stuff works. So uh, keep, keep that in mind as we go through, you're gonna see a few more of these lines or demand curves. Now, the supply and demand, the curve itself is, we're gonna be able to show you data that tells us exactly what's happening in the market. Now, the reason behind each of those is always a little more subjective. So uh, first we'll talk about demand. Uh, in demand, the trends in single family homes, all we're gonna talk about is single family homes, not, not all real estate. Um, this gets to be a little speculative, but part of why there's high demand is during the pandemic, the work from home market has really solidified and lots of people uh, want to be in the suburbs rather than the big cities for a lot of different reasons. So that's been suggested as one reason there's increase in demand. Another one, probably a big one, and most of you are probably aware of this one, is the lower mortgage rates. Uh, rates are at just amazing levels. Uh, I did this basic version of the study 10 years ago. And as you'll see in a little bit, a slide a little bit later, uh, rates are just dramatically lower than they were even just 10 years ago. Um, there's some high savings rates because of the pandemic. One benefit of the pandemic last year, people didn't go anywhere and they didn't spend as much money. So they saved a lot of money, which gives them money for down payments so they can buy houses. Uh, probably the biggest one, if it were, you were to ask me, well, what's really driving the marketplace right now in housing? And it's demand for a house from millennials. They are working their way into the prime home buying years. And even though, as Kevin mentioned earlier, how bad the economy was last year, people were afraid to leave their houses and all this sort of thing. Guess Guess what? They were all buying houses. Uh, believe it or not, demand has almost never been this strong. Uh, so the, the, a good explanation of that is probably the millennial. Of these factors that I'm covering, I would say that's probably the number one uh, feature. Okay, then uh, for the last few years, we've had low inflation. There's some question, will that actually continue? I really don't know about that they're late based on kind of all the stimulus hit in the marketplace but oops where'd we go i uh, lost my screen i'm gonna try it again i guess Okay, not not good. Uh... Um, I could try to share your screen. I have uh, I have that up. Um, but what do we okay. do? You want to give it one more shot, or because sometimes there is a delay. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm not seeing my. Oh, there we go. Maybe there it is. Let me try it one. Okay. Hmm. Yes, we see it, Dave. Okay, you can. Okay, let me get it back in. Um, okay, let me get to the right page then. Nope, I am not able to move it. Okay, what I could try to do, we'll see if this works, is uh, share your presentation, which I have a copy of. Let me try that. I can see the screen. Okay, do you see do you see it? Does everybody everybody else see that the screen? 
Yeah, we're at the beginning okay. of the screen. So move it down. Yeah, one more. Okay. Why don't you just tell me to, to move move the, the slide and I'll do that every time. Uh, do you want to put it in screen mode, screen share mode? Or slide mode? Oh, slide mode. Okay. Okay. Okay, now move back one one slide and then we'll be right where we were. And from current slide now. Yep. How's that? Uh, I see the, it's not in a slide mode, but I, I think we can maybe go with this anyway. Okay, well, let me, from the current slide, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, just, uh, yeah, well, let's just go with this, because it's, for okay. some reason. Okay, having... yeah, and I think I, yeah, I lose my capability to highlight with my marker, but that's okay, I'll just talk talk through it. Uh, the other thing that's driving uh, demand is in a lower right corner, the affordability. Uh, there are three elements to whether housing is affordable or not. Uh, one is the interest rates, which I've already mentioned, that's very favorable for people buying houses. Um, income is the last one. It's a little mixed because of some of the th points Kevin made. Uh, as much as some markets or some people are suffering a lot during the pandemic in the last few years, um, others are doing really well. If you are not in the hospitality and restaurant industry and you haven't lost your job, incomes are actually up quite substantially. And, and we'll show that with a slide later. Um, so two of the three things for uh, favorable demand are, are really doing well. Prices are high, which makes it harder to be affordable, but you'll find the other two things are overwhelming this. So uh, yes, Scott, if you could advance the slide. Okay, so that's sort of some of the demand drivers. Uh, but as we saw with the original graph, supply and demand, we have a uh, supply is also important. And we have another factor coming up here with we clearly have supply shortages. Uh, I would explain this in sort of two general ways. There's a lack of listings. Uh, I refer to that as the pandemic effect. Uh, who wanted to uh, list their house and have strangers come walking through your house at a time when everybody's afraid, everybody's wearing masks and they're afraid to go out in public and that sort of thing. So even if you did want to sell your house, a lot of people have delayed that process, which means there are not many houses available for sale. Uh, the other is a refi phenomenon. Because of the low costs or low interest rates, uh, people simply don't want to uh, sell their house at a time when they just paid 2000 in closing costs to refinance it. They feel they'd be losing money with that. So as a result of that, inventories, the actual supply of houses are very low. In fact, in some markets, it's less than two months of inventory. So in other words, if at the current pace that houses are selling, it would only take two months if more houses don't come on the market. It would take uh, less than two months before we'd be out of houses. There'd literally be no houses available for sale. Uh, 10 years ago when I did this study, it was 10 years uh, in terms of how, or I mean 10 months to of inventory available. And that's a lot more normal. So that's clearly a factor too. Now housing starts are up, which over time will help to alleviate this problem. But right now it's an issue. Uh, the supply is an issue. Uh, you can now move it, Scott. Okay, nationally, prices are up, way up, uh, over 10%. Uh, out of the 150 major metropolitan markets, uh, I've never seen so many markets that have a double-digit price increases from in the last year. So even though the economy suffered a lot last year, 
house prices have gone nuts for the some of those demand as well as supply issues we've talked about. So it is likely Fed, Federal Reserve is going to continue to keep rates low, uh, low rates increase demand, and so that's probably going to continue for a while. Uh, next slide. Okay, now we talked a little bit about where we are in the real estate cycle. There's basically a buyer's market and a seller's market. And each of those have two stages. And, and the easiest way to sort of identify what stage we're in is think in terms of who would you rather be in, in the current market? Would you rather be a buyer or would you rather be a seller? And as you can see with the, my use of the bold there for sellers, I think most people would rather be a seller because based on what's going on with the high demand, relatively low supply, uh, sellers are sitting in a great position. And as a result, they're able to sell their house for much more than they expected to. So uh, very good from a seller standpoint. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, okay, go one more. We'll save a little time. One more. Yeah. Oh, wait, we did that one. Uh, one more. Yeah, go one more. Okay, buyer stage one. Uh, 10 years ago when I did the study, this was the stage we were in. We had an excess supply of properties, prices were way down, demand was falling. Almost right through, as we go through that list, you'd find almost everything is the exact opposite today of what it was 10 years ago. So clearly we're not in a buyer stage one. Uh, advance it again, Scott. And I'm not even gonna bother with stage two. We're clearly not there either. There is where we, there is the sweet spot. We are currently in a seller stage one and I bolded all the characteristics of a seller stage one. We have a lowering supply of houses, building is starting to increase, relatively low unemployment if you consider where we were at the worst stages of last year. Uh, prices are clearly rising, demand is high, and as you'll see later in some of our data, uh, the median days on the market is still declining. And uh, so clearly seller stage one. W advance one more. Okay, now in seller stage two, uh, if we were in a bubble and sort of at the end where it was about to burst, we'd, that would be more characteristic of being at the end of stage two. So based on just that alone, uh, where we're pretty solidly in stage one, we're maybe beginning to move into stage two, which means again, before we're gonna see a big change, uh, we're probably not there yet. Uh, so the DOM is the days on market is gonna start to rise dramatically. And as you're gonna see later in some of our data, our local markets are starting to see this. So we might be moving from stage one into stage two. And then the prices for construction materials are starting to rise. And you would know this if you've tried to perhaps build a birdhouse in your backyard and went to the uh, building supply store to buy plywood for your birdhouse and you got turned down by the bank for the loan uh, to, buy, to uh, buy your plywood. Uh, building materials are crazy in terms of, so it looks like we are moving clearly, uh, at least locally into some of the seller stage two market. And the other areas, we're still not there. So it's got a ways to go. Uh, you can move it ahead. Okay, so basic principles here. Uh, we're gonna look at when you change demand, if demand is the driving force, uh, price and quantity are gonna be moving together. If we look and prices are going up and quantity of houses sold are moving down, that tends to mean something is going on with the supply uh, sector rather than demand. So we're going to now look at the actual data for the prices and quantity in various of the uh, national and local market. Uh, next slide. 
Okay. Uh, now, one thing, try not to get bogged down on, uh, we're going to show you a lot of data now. Uh, don't get bogged down on the individual numbers per, per se. What's important, and here's where I wish I had my marker, uh, the direction, the bottom row there, uh, that's what's important. If you look at the U.S. market, 2018 median prices was in like 260 range. Uh, 2020, it was up 300, so that was up. And, and then the next line was, is through March, uh, which is the latest data we had, the median price was up 334. So prices U.S. nationally are way up. I purposely didn't put uh, percentages. Again, don't want to overwhelm you with uh, all these numbers, but think direction. Direction is what's going to tell us what's going on. And then I also highlighted the Midwest. Same trend uh, over the last three years and then still currently in the first quarter, everything is going up. So prices are up in almost all, mar basically all markets. Uh, next. Okay, now we have the same thing, but with the quantity of homes selling. So even though prices are going up, the number of houses sold could be going up or it could be going down. And as you can see there in all markets, everything is up. So the trend is up in prices and it's up in quantity being sold. Uh, next. Now we're back to our uh, famous supply and demand curves. Uh, here though, if you notice what is explaining it, unlike the earlier illustration I gave where I showed the demand curve going down, if you look at uh, sort of the D, yep, right there, and then the D1. If you look, that's indicating an increase in, in the demand. And what we see here is the intersection, yep, oop, yep, the intersection there is, uh, shows prices are up and quantity is up. The only thing that could be explaining that is an increase in demand. So the, when all those markets are having prices and quantity up, it is because demand is increasing. It is not because of the supply issue. Because as you'll see here in a minute, if, if it was a supply issue, you, know, you wouldn't have both of those things taking place at the same time. And that's important to understand. Okay, next. Okay, this is a, just a quick summary of the affordability index. I won't spend much time on this uh, because I kind of covered it earlier. Uh, if you look in the bottom right corner, that composite index, that's sort of the key number for the Midwest. Uh, the income necessary to qualify is only 36,000 to qualify for the median priced house. Um, the family income is 88,000. This is what I was talking about before. If you've got a job and you've been working remotely from home, uh, your income the last few years has been going up and doing pretty well. So you have 247% of the income necessary to buy a house. So why would you want to rent when with very little effort and there's some tax advantages and all that? So it makes uh, buying a house extremely or look to be very desirable. So that's a good thing. So uh, let's move, move to the next one. Okay, here's that uh, indication of national inventory. This is the number of months of supply we talked about earlier. Again, 10 years ago, that month's supply in the right-hand column was 10 months. And 18, it was four. And as you can see there, it's been uh, declining. And as of through March, it was actually just a hair under two. Uh, so that a clear indication of supply uh, being down. Uh, next. And now here you can see if supply is down, which is what this graph illustrates, uh, that's a shift to the left. The, the right-hand supply is sort of where it started and a move from S to S1 would indicate what's going on with a decrease in supply. And, and the equilibrium point there shows, if you look down, follow the uh, little dotted lines, you have prices went up and, oh, wait, quantity goes down. Well, that can't be what's really explaining everything because we said prices were up and quantity sold was up. 
So although supply clearly puts pressure when supply goes down, it clearly puts pressure, upward pressure on prices. That isn't explaining the whole thing because otherwise you, when prices go up, people will be buying less houses and fewer houses would be sold. And that's not what we're actually seeing in those marketplaces. So it's a factor, but it is certainly not the main factor. Demand is the main factor. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we kind of have a perfect storm here. We got demand is up, supply is down. Both of those put upward pressure on the prices. And if I were a homeowner and thinking about selling, now is a good time. Now, don't wait, don't be greedy, because as you saw, even though it might go up a little more, um, you don't wanna be uh, trying to pick the peak. There's usually not a good percentage in trying to pick the maximum. Uh, now would be a good time if you got a place to sell or to live when you sell, that's the problem. It actually leads to a trend. A lot of uh, older, pe older folks are uh, nearing retirement. And they are actually, there's a big trend towards selling their house and moving into an apartment because then they get the benefit of the uh, appreciation in their homes. But uh, next slide. Okay, this is the now break from national and regional into Wisconsin. Um, and again, I'll focus just on the, again, forget kind of the numbers, uh, focus on those directions. Median prices and existing home sales for Wisconsin uh, are basically up. Uh, so they're duplicating the national trends we've already talked about. Central Wisconsin, that would be sort of the uh, four, four or five counties right around uh, Stevens Point and uh, Wausau and, and Marshfield. And those you see, find the exact same trend, up and up. So the same explanation, demand is the main driver here. So next slide. Okay, um, now the local markets is where things kind of get to be a little different. Now, for the last three years, the trend is the same as every place else, up, up, and up. And this is true for uh, the, the median prices, everything is up. But what you see in the year-to-date numbers below that, the second from the bottom row, is Marshfield is still up. Marshfield went from 143 to 159 in the first three months of the year. Uh, but look at the other three markets, they all went down. So something different is starting to change. And that is what we talked about with maybe shifting into a different stage of the real estate cycle locally. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind as we try to explain that. Next slide. And now here's the first difference here in number of or the unit sales, the quantity sold. Uh, everything else was up uh, except Marshfield. So Marshfield had prices going up and quantity sold down. So something different. So we need a different supply demand explanation. So next slide. Okay, there's what's going on in Marshfield is the one to the intersection to the right is the original supply and demand and if supply was going down from the original S to the S1, you would see prices going up and you see quantity going down. And that's exactly what we saw in the Marshfield data. And so that would be the explanation of what's going on. Something is causing uh, the supply in Marshfield to be even less or, or more of a factor than it was in any of the other markets. Uh, it still caused a rise in the price, that perfect storm, but you are now seeing that being a, the, starting to be the dominant factor. Yeah, apparently, you cannot find houses to buy in Marshfield. Uh, next one. The explanation for the other three markets would be supply is going up because that's the only thing that would explain how you see prices starting to go down in those markets which is what you see going from S to S1. And yet the quantity sold is still going up. So we have prices down, quantity up. That's, that's what was happening in, in those three markets, or is happening in those three markets. Next. 
Uh, let's skip the summary table, move, move to the next one. Okay, there's only two more uh, pieces of data that we wanna look at to really understand what's going on. And one is the uh, days on market, DOM stands for days on market. And here again, you, you find something that will reinforce the conclusions we've already drawn. Uh, if you look at the last three years, you see the average days on market are going down. Uh, when from 142, this is how long it takes someone to sell their house on average or median is about 142 days. Then it, at the end of 2020, it was 107. But look, it has now shifted in the first three months. It's now going up. This is very kind of counter to what other people have. If you talk to agents, they're all talking about, well, there are multiple offers. Houses are selling so fast and all that. Well, that actually doesn't, isn't supported by the data that, uh, that we're seeing now in the last month or two. Uh, so that is a change in all three or all four of the markets. That number, instead of continuing down, is starting to move back up, which means there's probably something changing in the market. Uh, next slide. Okay, the last one is the sales price list price ratio. And what we have there is, again, very surprising when I looked at it, because you would have expected it to be crazy high, above 100. That would mean that people are asking for a price of 100, and somebody is offering 105 or 110. That's what you get, you hear anecdotally a lot of there are multiple offers and so forth. But the data really just shows that on average, or the median, uh, if people are selling their house for about what the list price is. And uh, that's been stable for really the last three or four years, which was a little bit of a surprising piece of data. Okay, next slide. And then we're almost wrapped up. Uh, this just illustrates, I thought it would be nice to look at the perspective. I pulled the numbers from my previous research study 10 years ago. And you can see there from the right-hand column, in basically all markets, real estate has gone up quite a lot. And so that's true in central Wisconsin as well. Although we're not as, uh, haven't gone up as much as the national market, but um, uh, still pretty, real estate seems to still be a pretty good investment. Uh, last slide or next slide. So the question, do we have a housing bubble? Um, are any of the things we've talked about today Irrational, unexplainable, I don't think so. We're in a seller's market, would, which makes sense in terms of having the higher prices and so forth. So that's kind of explainable. We've talked about demand factors, demographics, interest rates, incomes, all support this increase in demand. We got low supply, low inventory. We had reasons for that, the pandemic, uh, refinance issues. So as a result of all of that, we can answer the question, do we have a housing bubble? And the answer is no, as you can see there in red. And last slide. I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank uh, National Association Realtors for providing data, Wisconsin Association, Central Wisconsin Board of Realtors, and Natalie Aneskovich, uh, the broker owner from Lakeland Real Estate here in Stevens Point. On that note, uh, I'm open to any questions. And thank you, Scott, for saving the day here with the uh, your version. Any questions? Uh, we do have a number of questions. Why don't we? Uh, uh, we also have a number of questions for Kevin Barr. But let's, since you just complete, let's let's do the ones for um, um, for you, Dave. And sure. I've been keep, keeping an eye on the, um, and, and you had some really good questions here. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. And, um, and if I mispronounce your name, Marv, uh, uh, please uh, forgive me. Uh, Marv Nolte asked, beyond millennials, I wonder how much demand is coming from investors. Is there data to support that companies and individuals are buying single family homes to use for rentals? Yeah, there's a lot of data on that. Hedge funds in particular, uh, those big evil hedge funds are 
uh, actually, they used to ignore the single family housing market because they were such small dollars. But a lot of companies now have pool large chunks of money and they're going into markets and buying up individual houses as investments for long-term hold. And that is clearly driving prices up as well. There's a lot of data to support that. Okay, uh, just one uh, quick comment by Jason Blanker who really provides some very interesting and kind of amazing uh, statistics. He says plywood prices are up over 500% and lumber is up over 400% year over year. Uh, of year. So, so that, that, that says a lot. Uh, Jeff yeah, Rice. That's where, uh, my, that's where I threw in my birdhouse joke. I, I ended up, I, I don't know if you could tell, I speeded up my presentation after we had our mishap. But my wife actually told me that birdhouse joke last night. And I decided that'd be perfect to slip in here on getting turned down for a loan for your birdhouse uh, because of the price of plywood. That's actually where that came from. <laughs> uh, next question is from a builder, uh, Jeff Rice. Uh, he asked, uh, well, he, he has a little bit of a background here. We're seeing the cost of building a new one or two family home increase by roughly 25% over the past six months. Uh, if the affordability of a new home drops out of range of most buyers and thus decreases demand, therefore incentivizing people to not sell their existing homes, wouldn't that cause a crash in housing prices? That's part one. And then part two is how do you see problems with the banking system? Uh, you know, homes not appraising out for purchase price, um, impacting demand on new home starts in central Wisconsin. Um, first part of that, the crash, again, I'm, I think crash is probably too harsh of a word. Uh, that sort of thing where the uh, high prices is, the affordability, as long as interest rates are low and incomes are high, as we've seen in the last three years, uh, it hasn't dampened uh, prices. Now, eventually, certainly prices can get high enough that people can't afford uh, houses anymore. And but again, that usually happens in more of a gradual, uh, that doesn't just run off the cliff, uh, as long as it wasn't a true bubble, like it was in sort of 2006 and seven and eight, that was kind of a bubble and it did crash, but then there was a lot of irrational reasons for why house prices were high. Uh, and what was the second part of the question again? Uh, the second part, how do you see problems with the banking system? You know, homes not appraising out for purchase price especially new homes impacting demand, uh, new home well, starts as such a okay. Wisconsin. I, yeah, um, I always see problems with the banking industry. Uh, banks are always uh, putting a damper on things. But in terms of it, houses will continue to appraise as long as they're selling. Uh, as long as they're selling for these high prices, the next house will sell for a high price too and be able to get an appraisal. It's again, uh, only if you get a little bit of that crash thing kicking in where suddenly it happens, then those houses can't get purchased and that'll put a damper on it. Okay. I have a question from Robert Good. Uh, what is your estimate on the time to transition to be the next phase of the seller's market and then the first phase of the buyer's market? Uh, that's very subjective. Uh, I, have, I have no crystal ball. Um, I personally would say it's a couple of years. I, I think it's still going to be uh, decent because the economy is starting to get better as all of Kevin's stuff. Uh, if we did this in the last three years with what was going on uh, and now we start getting into opening up as yet as of yesterday, we're really going to open up the economy more. That's going to make it stronger. That's going to mean people are going to still be buying houses and it's all going to work. I think that'll extend it quite a bit. It could be three, four years before we have to reevaluate. Okay. Uh, we do have three other uh, questions, but they're from faculty members. So, and because of, you know, we're running over time and I want to get to the question, uh, questions uh, to, you know, for Kevin Barr. Uh, Dave, if you could uh, basically answer those, uh, maybe a written question through the lecture in the chat box at, at, at the end. Sure. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to move to, to Kevin um, um, since uh, we have a couple of questions for him as well, and we're kind of running over on time. Uh, uh, first question uh, for Kevin is from Todd Kukan. 
uh, haven't you seen numbers to indicate that uh, businesses, you know, he hasn't seen numbers to indicate that businesses can fill their open positions. Uh, is there a talent attraction challenge? And what does your research say? I, I think there definitely is sort of an attraction challenge. Um, and I, I don't think the labor market or I don't think the job market is going to be the same post COVID as it was pre COVID. Now, exactly how much and things changed. Uh, that's a little bit of a crapshoot. That, that's a little bit hard to tell. But um, yeah, I mean, I do think that there's there's definitely going to be a little uh, imbalance between what uh, employers need and, and uh, potential people to fill those positions. That's going to take some time to work out. Because again, it's not going to be the same as it was uh, pre-COVID. Great. Uh, also, uh, Ryan Baxter, I think, asked a question that a lot of people are thinking about. You know, how can we print trillions of dollars and take on massive debt yet still have no or very little inflation? Uh, there's a number of factors that kind of play into that. I think if you look at what happened last year, I mean, basically we lost 22 million jobs in, in a couple of months. So, I mean, that's a lot of demand that was basically taken off the table. Again, some people continued, as, as Dave said, some people continued to do quite well during the pandemic. Uh, but a lot of people did, did not do that well in a pandemic. I, I think the key is when you start looking at these, you know, deficits and, you know, the amount of money that's circulating in times of economic growth, you don't want to be increasing your deficit. But when things are going bad, then, then you do, then you do have to spend money. I mean, you, you don't want to have any austerity program when, when things are going uh, poorly. So, Part of this discussion, I think, kind of really gets down to when do you do the policy that you choose to follow? And once the economic growth comes back, yeah, then you definitely want to kind of bring down the deficit and, and bring down the debt. Okay, um, we do have one more uh, question. Uh, and again, uh, there's a number of questions uh, that Dave can answer their faculty members and since we're lacking of time. Uh, I, I think Dave can answer those uh, individually, but we do have one from Jason Blanker. Uh, uh, this would be for Dave. Uh, can you talk to, uh, to the decline in home listings for sales? There are now more realtors than homes for sales. What happens when listings increase because people are willing to let people back into their homes to sell? If they flood the market with the typical number of listings and try to take advantage of higher prices, that will increase the existing home sale supply. Yeah, I think that'll happen, I think, this summer. As we move into summer, traditionally, people want to set, move and, and buy houses in summer, so they're settled in before the fall for their kids in school. So I expect that to happen here this, this summer. And I think that's part of maybe what's even happening already. Remember, the local markets, I showed the data was changing. And I think that uh, and supply was becoming much more of a, issue in in the local markets and i think that is clearly going to have that effect and that's the way it should but it, it won't be a crash it'll be a dampening of uh what you've had as kind of crazy price increases you're going to see either more modest increases or as you've started to see in three of those four markets you've seen uh that prices have come down a little but they're not crashing and I just have one more uh, for Dave. I, I, I skipped over this by, by mistake. Uh, this is from Ryan uh, Kronosky. Uh, could prices be tied to the quality of homes offered on the market? Uh, for example, more lower cost housing hitting the market as opposed to mid and upper cost housing. Um, it's a little bit hard to say. Just uh, again, I don't have data to support that. Uh, from anecdotally talking to lots of real estate agents and I have a lot of former students who are agents um, there the answer would probably be no uh, what I've been told is almost any house nice house mediocre you no know, luxury house all of them seem to have that same impact of what we've talked about here that you put it on the market and you get a lot of interest very quickly and in a lot of cases again they're bidding over the sale price Okay, well, thank you, uh, Kevin, and thank you, Dave, for your presentations. Uh, they really raised a lot of very interesting questions, and thank you for your answers. Uh, this really is at the end here. We're certainly uh, 14, 15 minutes you know, past our 9 o'clock hour. 
Uh, for, again, for those students who are uh, attending with regard to pro events, please send messages in the chat, a uh, private message in the chat to Professor Martin, and you wanna include three things, a name, ID number, and something you appreciated learning today. Thank you very much for attending.